as we can write um, some clear or different representation. As we as the segue is happening, I'll just comment that a couple of principles I felt I was hearing when you you're talking about curriculum design were around flexibility, uncertainty and dealing with uncertainty and iteration. Um, so for example, student feedback and continuing to practice. And I feel like those things for me came out what Chris was saying as well. It's not something interesting to Okay, so we welcome um, our next presenter, um, Cynthia Turnbull from HAP, who's going to tell us about field studies and tech, six design principles to flip classrooms inside and out. Great, well thanks so much for the invitation, Joe, and I'd also like to echo the acknowledgement of country. Um, as we look at um, federal elections coming up next year, I think it's important that we um, acknowledge the rich cultural um, heritage of 25,000 years worth of um, Ngambri and Ngunnawal um, presence here in the ACT and region and as we think to the future it's important to recognise that the past as well and to learn from that. So today I'm uh, delighted to share some fascinating findings on teaching without classrooms. These stem from an intensive course that I convened in Canberra this year on Australian foreign policy. Our students, one minibus worth, came from unis around the world, Berkeley, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge, University of Tokyo and ANU. Over three weeks, 30 teaching sessions were held around the ACT. Not a single session was held in a classroom. Over 60 experts were involved. We took the notion of flipping the classroom to the next level, turning Canberra into a real-time laboratory from where we could observe the end-to-end -end process of policy making from national parks to cultural and political institutions to Commonwealth departments, think tanks, consultancies and boardrooms. We put the spotlight on Canberra as the engine room of national policy, linking in where and how policy thinking takes place, how decisions are made, who implements policy. The genesis of this idea came from the CAP Dean, Michael Wesley, in response to a challenge from our VC, Brian Schmidt. ANU partners with a dozen premier research unis around the world through the Yaru network. Each year, Yaru partners offer their students the opportunity to spend time on another campus during the northern summer. While ANU has historically offered an engineering focus, for this year's edition, our dean proposed to design a capital experience. Canberra's small size and its concentration of experts, diplomats and politicians makes it the ideal setting to access the many spheres of influence on policy. We were within a 20 minute driving radius of all 24 venues. This year's prototype was designed to set the template for what could be achieved in other capitals. This morphed into a transformative experience for both scholars and teachers. Today I'll share six design principles that came out of the course. These are not so much a formula for success as an aspirational pathway to follow. I did not have these in front of me when I started, far from it. In the spirit of prototyping, the things that did not go to plan can be as illuminating as those that did. This is where these principles come from, what I would do next time. To think big, plan early. To pull together the bold idea of hosting 30 teaching sessions outside of classrooms, everything hinged on partners coming to the party. This went way beyond just checking calendars and availability. In fact, going to experts early, before we had settled on dates, times and formats, opened the door for our partners to think through innovative approaches to the themes we put to them. While not everyone did respond to my initial emails, I'd say 75% did. And from my initial email, basically a hi and can you help, some of the best ideas came from our partners. Melissa Conley-Tyler at the Australian Institute for International Affairs offered to host a real-time session replicating the ABC TV show Q&A complete with cameras, a live panel, and questions from the audience, so our scholars. The service design consultancy ThinkPlace hosted a full day workshop based on a real brief that they were working on for the Department of Jobs, replicating workshops that they had held with senior policymakers. The Canberra Innovation Network co-designed with us a rapid prototyping session on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we pulled off a fabulous event, um, accidentally actually, um, it just sort of happened. Um, a festival of big policy ideas with the Canberra Sustainable Development Hub, which featured a panel of lightning talks from three Canberra influencers, opened by the ACT's climate change minister, Shane Rattenbury. All of these unexpected highlights were only possible because we contacted experts early on, 
to us not only for their availability, but to bring them into the design process. This requires early planning and also making time to go out and meet with key contacts in their venues to get a sense of what is possible and also to show commitment from our side. For the academic side of things alone, I spent two months full time from being briefed by Nick Farrelly on the course to greeting our scholars on a cold and snowy day in late June. Before I even joined as convener, our student enrolments had already been sought and accepted, so all of that student work had been done. In saying this, no matter how much you plan, um, of course, um, there will always be last minute changes that will pop up, and that's just part of the fun. Second design principle, nurture your online platform. Abandoning classrooms to take teaching into the real world requires a well-crafted online platform. As a six-unit accredited course within the ANU structure, our course had an explicit set of learning outcomes to align with and a lot of substantive terrain to cover. My guiding approach was that foundational concepts would be covered in daily pre-reads and pre-course materials. Our practical sessions would give students the chance to test out their newly acquired knowledge by posing questions and probing experts in real time. Here, our online platform was clearly the backbone of success. My first port of call was to contact Gratz's digital learning team at CAP, as well as colleagues at Chelt, including Rebecca, who walked in a couple of minutes ago, there she is. Um, for the next two months, ramping up over a very busy week or two, uh, the CAP team were key in designing the digital structure of the syllabus, as I worked in parallel to shape the substantive content. What emerged was very much a partnership of equals between structure and content design. Understanding what ANU's Moodle platform Wattle could do helped me think about what type of content would work best. <coughs> Hearing Gratz's case studies of CAP courses in linguistics helped prompt me to think about how and when students absorb information. Looking at the collaborative options for students to communicate on Wattle got me thinking about the role of verbalising new ideas as a way to solidify concepts. The Wattle platform that emerged was a day-by-day -day set of materials resources and reading lists, with intuitive scrolling, <coughs> imagery and bite-sized chunks of info that I could preload and publish at daily intervals. So how did this play out? During our group brainstorm on the last day of the course, students shared their thoughts on what worked, what didn't and what they would change. One idea stood out, which was to develop a series of short five-minute videos to cover the fundamental concepts as a supplement to the dense lists of often dry academic texts. <coughs> And this idea came from a non-native English speaker. The takeaway was clearer English, same complexity of ideas, which is hard to find in the canon of Australian foreign policy. These videos would sit very neatly on Wattle with minimum tech and spend, albeit with more planning and time. Third design principle, go paperless. <coughs> no classrooms means no handouts, no PowerPoint presentations, no reams of printed paper. This certainly kept our experts alert as they had to engage in a conversational mode of interaction as opposed to lectures or classes. Our students were equally responsive to this due to the rather wonderful secondary effect of being on the move all the time. Students quickly abandoned tablets and laptops given the high paced schedule of minibuses, minicabs and little access to charging stations. With last minute changes happening from day to day, have, having a virtual schedule which I updated daily on Waddle was a lifesaver, as students knew to check in every day online, rather than relying on information in printed handouts. An early conversation at Grazia highlighted an absolutely pivotal point. How would students be able to take notes while on the move? To do this, we co-designed an e-book for use on phones and tablets. A virtual notebook structured according to the daily things making it intuitive and simple for students to record their notes on the fly. The ebook format is flexible when it comes to links and other dynamic tools, such as embedding videos. The idea was that students flying in from around the world could have an easily transportable resource to take home, which would cover the whole syllabus without adding an extra gram to their bags. How did this play out? The jury's still out on this one. Uh, roughly one third of our students took to the ebook format, so that's four or five students, which roughly equates to the full time days it took Grazia, her team, and I to develop this. Uh, in hindsight, I would look at making this a glossary of key concepts, or maybe more of a workbook with structured questions. We may have tried to do a bit too much with this, making it both a full syllabus and a virtual notebook. 
I would add in an extra week on content development to think through the intended outcome. Overall, I'm going paperless, given the systems and experts we have here on campus and the absolute joy of not having to coordinate printing, I cannot recommend more highly the paperless principle. There are no drawbacks that I can see with massive upside in the time and cost saved, not to mention forests. There's one drawback. <laughs> principle. Mix up venues, formats and speakers. With 30 half-day teaching sessions over 15 days, two weekends in between, designing for zero classrooms required careful thought and planning to strike the right balance of high energy and downtime. In the end I opted for a consistent formula. Each morning and afternoon session began and ended at the same time and place, namely the ANU residence on campus where students were staying. Two hour lunch breaks were scheduled in at the same time each day as students had full board at Bruce Hall. There were four days when we had lunch on the go and we worked this into our itinerary. This approach meant that students could reset before most changes of venue. Another decision we made up front was that the first two days would be gentle on content so that students could bond in an informal format, meeting Australia's national emblems at Timber Miller <coughs> and exploring campus during a guided tour with local Noonan War elder at Wally Ball. Since we had no limitations on physical abilities, we built in walking on foot to various venues as a way to energise and recharge in between sessions. So while there was a routine around start times, lunch times and end times, in between we had a real mix of indoors and outdoors, guided tours and round tables, workshops and panels, which meant that students were always alert and active. One downside in all the venue changes was that it was complicated keeping our maxicab company in sync with our activities. When rain struck, we also had to quickly rework a planned outdoor segment. And this turned out fine, more by luck than anything else, I think, because despite my daily updates of when and where cabs were needed, we were still at the mercy of camera traffic and cabbies with short tempers. However, when comparing the costs of having, say, a Murray's bus or a minibus instead of maxi cabs, this would have quadrupled our costs. Overall, I would say that the transport element is easily managed and that the huge benefits of mixing up venues and speakers far outweigh this. An easy metric for this is to point to consistently high numbers of students from day one to day 15, even though attendance wasn't mandatory. Fifth design principle, building boundaries. My thorniest challenge was building in boundaries, both in real time and online. Bringing together a small group of students from many different places who go from never having met to spending 20 days together, 9 to 5 p.m. during weekdays, eating and sleeping in the same campus <coughs> residence, was highly challenging for two of our students after an after-dinner discussion led to tensions around how to talk about food and body shape and cultural and ethnic traditions. This escalated into the group chat on WhatsApp, which became a conduit for personal grievances. Uh, in my ANU teaching experience, tensions tend to dissipate and de-escalate between lectures and tutorials by sheer dint of time and space. Not so in an intensive environment with no classrooms, where it's harder to avoid someone you are not getting on well with. We manage this by quite literally acting as human barriers, for example by sitting in the lunch area at Bruce Hall so that students could opt to sit with me if they felt uncomfortable. While this worked for this course, there are better ways to set boundaries for students. Uh, when ANU students go on exchange programs abroad, they go through training and induction about intercultural awareness. While they may not be familiar with the country they are visiting, they have similar benchmarks in terms of behaviour set by ANU. On this basis, I would recommend tailoring training and induction on the first day of any zero classroom course. In this course, this would be clearly laying out behavioural expectations for half a dozen nationalities visiting Australia. When it comes to social media, it's useful to remind students that anything that takes place in social media can be captured through screenshots or easily recorded secretly using just a phone. This all happened. Uh, I would include in the day one induction an explicit reminder about all of this to students. More broadly, I would also advocate for an interventionist approach when students cross boundaries. 
which means stepping in as teachers to intermediate between students in dispute, rather than letting students sort it out for themselves, which would be my most natural inclination in a classroom type setup when you have a week of breathing space in between lectures and tutes to calm things down. The last design principle is on-the-go assessments. So how do you design assessments when you're in a zero classroom environment? And more importantly, when you are constrained by an intensive course format. I would say that of all the challenges we designed for, this one was the most exciting. Over the years that I've taught at ANU, assessments have tended to sit within quite a narrow bandwidth, basically variations on essays. For this course, I wanted to design assessments that would sit within the three-week parameters of the course to really push students to reflect and learn together and while in learning mode and of course meet the reporting requirements for out-of-session AMU courses. Given the disparity of disciplinary backgrounds, from a pure mathematician to an environmental scientist and an engineer, as well as experienced third and fourth year security studies students, I was delighted to be given free reign to go far beyond traditional assessment formats to accommodate for this double constraint. Starting with the principle that students would bring either a tablet or a laptop with them, or at the very least a mobile phone, I settled on five different formats, ranging from a daily Twitter takeover to weekly blog posts and three assessment pieces that built off the back of a full day negotiation simulation, which involved a mock government cabinet drafting a $50 billion foreign policy package. This package was presented during a mock press conference at the National Library with our VC, Brian Schmidt, where we asked our invited audience to step into the shoes of curious journalists and pepper our cabinet with probing questions. This full day exercise led to three assessments, two of which were due by the students on the last weekend of the course and one a fortnight later. The first was a reflective podcast where each student would talk about the strategies they used during the negotiations. The second was a departmental memo where each student would draft a short, sharp memo for the Commonwealth Department they represented during the simulation to outline the benefits of a negotiated package. The third was a more classic research report for each student to nominate the foreign policy issue they believed was most vital, um, as well as proposed policy solutions to address that particular foreign policy issue. All five assessments required students to listen attentively and engage during the course without presupposing any base knowledge in how to write a classic Hass essay. The flexible format relied more on students' observational and analytical skills rather than research with the final assessment piece requiring research, but with students able to choose a foreign policy issue that they had particular interest in. Of these five assessment pieces, I was most blown away by the Twitter takeover, where students really excelled in finding new ways and formats to bring their allocated day into the spotlight, from polls to snap interviews and even a short movie, which one of our students put together in under 30 minutes of post-production, which is a real feat. And I encourage you to check it out on our Twitter feed. Um, in fact, our amateur documentary maker went out to take, went on to take out the popularly, popularly voted accolade of social media champion, as voted by the students in the class. Um, yeah, and actually, I should again acknowledge Rebecca and Jill, who came up with the Twitter idea and with most of the the genesis of those assessment pieces. So it's really interesting to take a, a technology forward look at assessment rather than looking at assessment and seeing how technology could be blended into it. There we go. Thank you. Shameless <laughs> applause uh, to you. Rebecca is part of the education and science team. We've taken our office to work on where that position comes. Um, thank you, Timothy. I think that was a great example of a more expansive perspective on course design, what science and folk might usually take, given the needs you have to this So, we have time for a couple of questions um, from the audience. I just really love how you um, did that in the end. I'm sort of at the very beginning of the morning, and so I just love what you did, how you described it. Um, but um, one thing, um, have you thought about whether, it could, whether those principles and, and the format would be applied on a more, less intensive, short, sharp course? Uh, like, it seems to me that you possibly could by having episodes to it. But it, it would probably be very exhausting to try and do that for six months. Even if you have, what do you think about that? Um, I think the way that the assessments worked was that our students were together as a cohort in this really intensive format yeah. and that kind of was the glue that made it all yeah. work so well. So the blog posts were super interactive and we'd pick up on the questions and, and comments and the minibus on the way to the next thing. 
So um, I don't know if these assessments would um, work well in that sort of normal dissipated four month semester. Um, but there's no reason why we couldn't try. So, And I'd love to teach this course again, so if anyone's in the market for a, an intensive three week foreign policy course. It's not myself, you put market as a short course, not a short Yeah, so there's thoughts in the, I guess, in the pipeline at the moment are some of the J courses that Harvard are looking at developing with the ANU. This would fit in quite neatly as well. And also a clever way to get around the CAPS, student CAPS, which I know is, is on everyone's mind at the moment. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Well, we've uh, reached the time, so with that, we'll thank Timothy.